from dog tags to DNA, the armed forces have used various techniques to solve mysteries of missing service members, beginning before the Civil War. The evidence is now preserved at the National Museum of Health and Medicine in a new exhibit called Resolved, Advances in Forensic Identification of U.S. War Dead. Sergeant Brian Buckwalter has more. All right, guys, I'm going to make one more run and i got to get out of here. But instead, there's a crash, an investigation. Pieces of the puzzle are gathered from the field. It's then that forensic scientists begin to put the story together. It's work that first began essentially during the Civil War, when material evidence, like some sort of tag, was just about all they had to go on. The individual service member had to go get them on their own. They had to, had to pay a dollar. Those that didn't buy a medallion would do things like pen their name on a piece of paper, or they would carry their letters with them. By the early 1900s, the services began collecting fingerprints, less to identify those killed at war, and more to catch service members filing false pension claims. Now the FBI routinely collects prints from every service member. You can have the best science in the world to look at the postmortem, uh, from, from the postmortem, the after the, the body itself, but unless you have the antemortem data, you can, you can, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to make an identification. Dental charts became important points of data collection in World War I, but a certain dentist by the name of Paul Revere became one of the first to make a dental ID when during an exhumation he recognized his own work. Paul Revere uh, fashioned a, a dental bridge for Major General Joseph Warren. He made out of animal teeth and copper wire. Later on, uh, his family and friends wanted his body and wanted his body exhumed to give him a proper individual burial to be identified. Paul Revere went along with them when they opened up the grave and they were looking through the bodies. He says, that must be him. That's the dental work that I did. After World War II, the human skeleton most often provided identity clues in a mass effort to return war dead from overseas. The length of a femur can indicate stature. A skull can reveal race. Sometime during the Korean War, the concept of concurrent return became policy. That is, rather than wait until combat operations had ceased before collecting remains, bodies were brought home as close to the time of death as possible. It wasn't until the late 80s that medical examiners were organized into an umbrella office for pathology, radiology, and toxicology labs. In Dover, Delaware, the ME can use a scanner to conduct a virtual autopsy that additional set of data that allows them to be more directed in their autopsy to help figure out in a, in a more efficient manner uh, the cause and manner of death. The medical examiner has also incorporated the use of mitochondrial, then nuclear DNA, to make positive identifications. Again, no matter how good the science, without anti-mortem material, there's nothing to match what's found in the field. So each service member now has DNA information on file. The science has come a long way. But the mission remains to bring every American home. Marine Sergeant Brian Buckwalder, Pentagon Channel News. Colonel Charles Sharp was shot down in North Vietnam in 1965. His remains were recovered but never positively identified until 41 years later. His is an unusual DNA identification success story. It's also a love story. We talked with his widow, Patricia. Master Sergeant George Maurer has her story. I liked his gentleness, the way he looked, the way he walked, the way he talked, and uh, always was holding my hand like he was uh, protecting me. Chuck and Patricia Scharf married when she was 18 years old. Twelve years later, he went to Vietnam. And then he said, chances are I may get shot down. And I looked at him as if to say, no, you won't. He said, I just want you to be prepared. I would get uh, three letters, maybe two letters a day, and then for about a week I wouldn't get any because of the situation there. Just wait until I come home. <laughs> Days before he was due to return, Colonel Scharf's F-4 Phantom II was shot down over North Vietnam. It would be more than a decade before his designation could be changed from missing in action to killed. Uh, they found my husband's bridge. They found the, um, the um, scapulars. They found his wallet, parts of uh, a checkbook. 
They found his ID tags. They brought back bone fragments. There was a ceremony at Arlington National Cemetery, but DNA testing had failed to prove Scharf's identity. Then came a call from j in Honolulu. They wanted to know if she had anything of the colonels that she hadn't mentioned before. And I says, the only thing I have left is the love letters. And it was a pause on the telephone saying, love letters? And I said, I have them in a shoebox wrapped in plastic. An old habit, saving letters, combined with another. Miss Scharf always opens her letters from the side. The saliva still on the envelopes contained enough DNA to make a positive ID. It was almost as if she knew, Patricia knew that she had to keep those letters. You can't explain the feeling that came out of my soul. A second funeral and a final resting place. I am glad I have him at the cemetery on, and it's so beautiful out there. It's not a jungle. It's not the wet mud. I tell him what's going on. <laughs> I said, babe, you just don't know <laughs> what's going on here. But uh, we've got you back, and that's it. Yeah, and it makes me happy. Air Force Master Sergeant George Maurer, Pentagon Channel News. The Scharf case is featured as part of the recovered exhibit at the National Museum of Health and Medicine. The museum is located on the campus of Walter Reed Army Medical Center. For the Pentagon Channel, I'm Sergeant Ted McDonald.